Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, very good morning to everyone. Yeah, still morning. Um, thank you so much for being together with us uh, today. Firstly, I would like to extend our thanks to Encik Yazid for enlightening us uh, with a snapshot of uh, thick uh, OGSE blueprint that was recently launched. And I would like to also take this opportunity to thank, uh, not to thank, sorry, to congratulate NPRC. Uh, for um, you know the, the launch of the blueprint. Right, I am Afik, um, and I'll be moderating our panel session this morning. Uh, join with me today, uh, four from, uh, profound gentlemen, as uh, <coughs> by our MC, Encik uh, Yazid, uh, President CEO of uh, NPRC, Encik uh, Rao, uh, CEO of Helium, Encik Yusri, uh, CEO of Delta Oil, and Tiasa and Bahad and Chi Azizou, sorry, as Senior Vice President of Hong Kong Investment Bank. And I'm truly honored to be virtually surrounded by the Chief and President today because uh, I, on the other hand, um, I, on the other hand, uh, not even a chief in my own house. I have a lot of uh, bosses to report to, including my children. Right? Okay. Um, can I ask all of the speakers to switch on your camera, uh, just to, to be sure? Uh, I think Nche Azizul is uh, still not on the screen. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Nche Azizul, but I can't see uh, your video. It was on uh, earlier, but not now. Can you see me now? No, I think just continue. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll come back later. No, unfortunately not. But it's okay. I'll, I'll let you to start uh, your video while we proceed. At least we can hear your voice. Right. Um, so for the just a bit of context, I think for the benefit of our audience today, um, please allow me to share some of the context um, that we're going to be discussing in the next hour. Uh, well, Nj Yazid has already shared uh, the vision and what entails behind OGSD blueprint. And today, um, we wish to peel further the onion to better understand how it will impact the energy industry, putting more focus on the natural gas um, you know, business and industry in Malaysia. We would like to also touch a little bit on the sustainability aspect and ESG, which is also one of the strategic pillars under OGSD blueprint, right? Right. Um, if you don't mind, gentlemen, I would like to start with Mr. Rao. Uh, well, we know that the OGSE sector is one of the main contributors towards uh, the prosperity and growth of you know, Malaysian gas industry, yes. Um, and it has been over the past decades, we know that. And Dilium has been one of the longest members of MGA. And perhaps, uh, Mr. Rao, you can share the importance of OGSE sector to the gas industry. Hi, hi, Afi. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you know, most of the questions was already answered by Yazid just now in his presentation. You know? So I will not bore you with those details, but uh, I, will, I would like to talk, maybe take it from a different angle. Yeah, uh, A lot of talk about energy transition. It's, uh, it's something that if it doesn't come up at any conference, then you have failed to do your job. Uh -huh. So what does energy transition means? I think we, we need to grasp that idea and then I get to the gas in a minute. I think first of all, it's very clear that all countries, organizations have to move towards decarbonization and elimination of emission. That's foregone conclusion. That's what we are working towards. Second one is that the, this is another hard truth yeah, that people are very confused. The second one is that uh, hydrocarbon is here to stay. We have to accept that. And natural gas is going to be a key element of that. And if you look at the statistics, natural gas, among all the fossil fuel, is going to continue to grow. You can't, it may reach a peak, but at this point in time, it's on a growth trajectory. Now, the third one is that on the energy transition that we all have to accept is that we have to work together, collaborate adopt new technologies that's available. I think that's what Yazid was trying to say earlier. Now, let's look at global figures and then I'll get to the Malaysia part of it. If you look at coal, yeah, total fossil fuel 
It's about 82, 83% of energy globally. Coal is about 27%, oil is about 31%, and gas is about 25%. So the biggest polluter is coal. You can't deny that. Yeah? That's 27% of energy globally comes from coal. And that has to disappear before it starts encroaching into oil and gas. Yeah? That's something that I'm just laying this on the table so that we understand the importance of oil and gas, gas specifically. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, and the other point we need to take note when it comes to Malaysia is that Malaysia is top 20 when it comes to gas reserves globally. Yeah? We've got plenty of gas. We always say that Petronas is very gassy, which is true. Yeah? Um, that you have to take note of. And the other point we all have to remember when it comes to Malaysia is that the LNG complex in Bintulu, you know, is the world's largest production facility in a single location for LNG. Globally, yeah, it's a single location, it's the largest in the world. And you look at Malaysia, on the other side of it is that we also came up with the first floating LNG facility in the world. That is the FLNG, uh, PFLNG1, Satu. So gas plays an important, important role for Malaysia. Now, let me just digress a little bit more, yeah? Uh, we talked about energy transition. Yes, energy transition is there. Every country is working towards, you know? But what people don't realize is that energy, energy transition will come, you know, the promise is that they're gonna make energy cheaper. But that is a fallacy. In my view, energy transition will come with a premium. That is another reality that we'll have to accept it. You know, despite the trillions of dollars of subsidies that have gone into renewable, any energy transition going from fossil fuel to renewable will come with a premium. That you cannot deny that. Yeah. So that further puts a lot of pressure on the economies of growing developing nation now the other hard truth that uh, you know few years ago gas was seen as a bridging fuel between fossil fuel era to the post fossil fuel era there was a big talk about it if you remember five six years ago gas is the way to go because it's cleaner which is a reality gas is much cleaner than oil and especially coal yeah, you compared about if you make a comparison, it's much much cleaner energy compared to the other fossil fuels. So, gas will be the last one to be touched on. So there's a lot of, in fact, that's the other reason why the prime minister was talking about gas. Yeah, the other thing that 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 interesting of late, yeah, in the reason uh, winter as as Europe is heading towards winter, there was an issue with intimacy, inti intermittency problem, meaning yes. they suddenly in UK, they had this thing that called wind drought. I don't know how many of you read about it. You know, wind drought, you know, you talk about droughts, you know, no water, no uh, this thing. But now they're talking about wind drought. Wind drought caused the intermittency in energy supply for Europe. Okay. So the biggest eloquent in the, in the room today in the renewable energy is that intermittency can renewable continue to give the sustainable energy in a possible future it's a big question mark now that's you know so there's a lot of talks about how renewable is going to take over gas and i think there's a lot of fallacy in that a lot of governments who don't want to recognize that because they've got a green agenda I'm not saying that we don't want to go to carbon completely, you know, getting rid of carbon emission and so on. Yes, but the numbers, the time factor that they put in place, I don't think the world can meet that. So what I'm trying to tell you is that, again, to my second point I mentioned to you just now, is that 
hydrocarbon is here to stay. Natural gas is going to be key element in a long for a long long time. So the concerns about you know uh, renewable is going to replace all this is to me it will happen. It will be slow process, but it's going to take a long time beyond maybe beyond our lifetime and our children's lifetime. But it will happen. That's the way. But however, don't forget that the cake is getting bigger. Even if you look at gas, eh? uh, if you read recently, I think I saw gas gas forecast is going to go, grow by uh, almost 1,900 1, BCF to more than 5,900 BCF globally. So you're looking at 20, 30% growth in the next uh, 30 years. Yeah. So it is, when, when I say growth, meaning it's not growth in the total energy, as a percentage might be smaller, but the pie gets bigger. So what I'm trying to say is that the three points I mentioned to you just now is what we all have to take away. Yeah. One is that, you know, yes, we have to work towards greener energy. Two is that natural gas is going to be key element, you know, for for, for, for for energy for energy purpose. And three is that we need to adopt new technologies. So I don't know if I've answered the question and alleviated the concerns that people have when it comes to our industry. I'll pick back to you. Thank you so much. Uh... Mr. Ra, I think uh, you probably just wrap the entire conversation that we have today uh, in one question. Um, yes, I, I I can't agree more with you uh, when you mentioned that gas has a more prominent role to play, especially last year, if I can recall correctly, um, our government even uh, mentioned again about the role of gas uh, in the future of our country. Right. Um, moving along, uh, talking about the economics in uh, Malaysia, we know that the OGSE industry contributes about uh, five to eight percent to our GDP. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chair it. And I would like to go to Encik Yusri here. I would like to ask, has the role of OGSE evolved in the gas industry over the years, you as one of the players? Okay. Clear? Uh, here one was Afiq. Thank you very much, Afiq. And um, you know, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh, and uh, very good morning to all. Um, I think I have to thank you, Yazid, because Yazid had uh, you know uh, put the uh, platform really clear, and I think we see you know moving forwards so we have at least until 2050. Hopefully, we can we still be there by then. But anyhow, Afiq. Um, you know, I've been in industry for, for, for more than 25 years. I think, uh, you know, some of you may be longer than me, but, um, you know, over the years, a oil and gas uh, service equipment, you know, OGSE in, call, in short, you know, has basically has play, played a very critical and crucial roles, you know, in, in shaping oil and gas industry. You know, um, you know, for gas in particular, for example, OGSE role becoming more crucial, you know, because, um, you know, the demand, for the technologies, you know, with competitive costs, you know, today, you know, in 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 this pandemic situation, for example, cost has become, you know, the the main elements, right? So, uh, yes, you have technology, but it must be competitive enough, you know, and 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 the client in in uh, in particular case, Petronas and the rest of the PAC, they they are, you know, particularly uh, actively searching for this so best solution in the world, you know, and um, you know, just to cope with the demands. Uh, you know, gas in the market. But, um, you know, for me, just to make it quick and simple answer, Afik, to you, you know, over the years, um, you know, we just, and a contractor or, you know, just service provider at the beginning of the era, oil and gas, or gas in particular. But now, you know, you, you can't, you can't be, you know, away with it. You know, we are basically part of the solutions, you know. We, we, we grow together over time. And, and I personally see, you know, how, how does this um, this industry industry's growth, you know? Um, so I think I end this with uh, you know my 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 words by saying that collaborations and also continuous engagement basically are the key, you know, for this. So so let's start with a short first, Afik, because I know there's a few questions coming up, you know, hot questions. So so I'll pass back to you. So that is my thought on how does it evolve, you know, over time. Thank you, Encik Yusri. Uh, thank you for the uh, comprehensive answer there. Uh, Encik Yusri mentioned about 
uh, you know, cost. And uh, and Chira also mentioned about uh, the need of investment towards new technologies, uh, you know, uh, ahead of us. And I would like to now go to Encik Azizul, uh, you know, from the uh, financial uh, institution. The investment from the energy sector, uh, in our view, is evolving globally, given the energy transition, you know, about green premium and also uh, investment towards new technology, as mentioned. So from the financial sector viewpoint, is the Malaysian gas industry an attractive investment? That's number one. And number two, Following up from that, is energy a sector that is growing from the investment perspective, Encik Rizal? Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Afiq, for the question and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, I'd I like to refine that, that question a bit. Um, when we talk about financial sector, uh, we essentially looking at the financial institution, which is essentially the banks. Um, and the uh, investors, uh, uh, the asset owners, uh, such as asset management companies and the likes. So for, for, for the banks, uh, the, the decision is whether to decide whether oil and gas is a sector that they wish to have a larger exposure on, to retain or to scale back. For, for the investors, um, investors is to decide whether the oil and gas industry is able to provide an average above, uh, above average return in a, in a mid to, to long run. But uh, in, in general, the, the view on, on oil and gas has been turning positive uh, due to a number of factors. I mean, they, they, they're looking at projected you know, higher oil prices by, by 2021, around 70 US dollars per barrel. There's also you know, uh, expectation on, on stronger commitment from, APEC to keep, uh, from OPEC to keep uh, oil prices afloat. And they also you know, anticipate Perhaps you know Petronas will, will be spending a bit more on 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 capex uh, for second half 2021. So this one will, this will have a trickle down effect to to most oil and gas services companies in Malaysia, and there's also a rising expectation uh, for global uh, uh, demand for 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 gas in future. Uh, why? Because being gas is the transitional fuel towards the net zero emission goal. But uh, banks. You know, uh, in reality, uh, banks are, are still selective on, on new exposures to oil and gas, and investors remain cautious. Why? Um, for for banks, right? Uh, the oil and gas sector is deemed to be a sector that that uh, has a high exposure to climate change. So over time, I mean, uh, of late, we we we're seeing that Bank Negara has been rigorously imposing you know requirement for bank to disclose uh, climate related risks. So this this rising expectation from from Ben Negara on the Malaysian FI is is to to really treat climate risk like any other financial risk. So what this means is that you know ESG risk will then be factored in into the overall risk assessment uh, of the bank. Um, you know for now you know uh, the, the the trend will then lead towards you know. Uh, it would translate to a higher cost of borrowing for oil and gas company compared to the one that doesn't have any ESG framework in place. Um, and of course, you know, from the bank's perspective, the oil and gas companies pursuing carbon neutral will, will, will be viewed favorably. Uh, for the investors, um, uh, it would then, how attractive uh, they would look at oil and gas, it depends on how fast and how well they are adapting to the changing landscape. Of course, we all know that the oil and gas market now is, is in a transition stage from into low carbon and, and climate resilient. So uh, oil and gas is the most exposed to this transition. Um, so, so companies that is pursuing uh, clean energy um, uh, has, has led to, to a lot of oil and gas company allocating their, their capex uh, towards renewables, be it in a new investment uh, or, or strategic partnership, collaboration, setting up new business units uh, to, 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 to look into the RE space. So, so what we have seen in, in, in this uh, space is that you know, there have been aggressive uh, mergers and acquisition route that has been taken it by, by all the gas company. But I'd like to point out uh, the, 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 the change in, in the trend of investment uh, worldwide. Um, what we have seen those days, you know, maybe 10 years ago, the ESG investment um, 
are quite confined to maybe a small group of ethically and socially responsible investment uh, investors. But uh, now they has they has turned around and he has gone mainstream. So we we've seen a lot of participation from from institutional investors uh, across all markets. So um, they they were you know, uh, the ESG asset across all five markets has been growing quite significantly. So um, when we look at asset allocation itself, uh, fifty percent of the asset is 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 held by public equity. And thirty six percent or so uh, is is via fixed income. It shows this is quite a, a start, a, a uh, uh, quite evident that, that there is a very healthy demand for mm -hmm. for uh, ESG assets uh, for oil and gas. Um, why? If I if I may if I, if I may raise to this point is that uh, there, there there seems to be a study that that mentioned that company that that has better sustainability practice tend to have a better operational performance and and better or superior stock prices compared to the one that that is lower uh, that is rated lower for for ESG uh, why because this company tend to to to, to adopt a uh, rigorous assessment on on their business model to include the non financial risks uh, related to ESG so um in, in a nutshell i think uh, I, I suppose everyone seems to be to be cautious but um, um, every, you know, the investor side and the banks are, are, are quite hopeful to see this this wave of changes coming in into into the oil and gas space and see how the players react. So, so that's my 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 thoughts on this uh, on this uh, questions. Go back. Go ahead to Rafik. Thank you. Yeah, Lizzo, <clears throat> thank you so much um, for pointing out about you know uh, the trend of investment that has grown. Uh, <clears throat> Before this ESG, like you mentioned, wasn't being put uh, too much of significance uh, towards the overall evaluation of the risk. Um, and now it has become more significant than ever. So I would like to go back to Encik Yazid now. Uh, recently, our Prime Minister tabled our 12th Malaysia plan, RMK12, uh, that's going to run for about five years, mentioning about sustainability as one of the focus, right? Uh, at the same time, as you have presented earlier, Sustainability is also one of the four pillars under OGSE blueprint, right? And um, will and this will be uh, supporting the industry as well. How do you think, or how can the Malaysian gas industry benefit from this? Uh, thank you, Afik. I think as mentioned, um, that's a good question. Thank you for that. I think as mentioned by Azizul, the, you know, the we can't live without sustainability at the moment. Uh, you know, every aspect of business is, is looking at ESG sustainability as new way of doing business. Yeah. And uh, just like to highlight here, when you talk about sustainability, our tendency tend to focus more on the emission part, the environmental, the E part of the SG. We talk about climate control, talking about you know reducing emission, which is very very important. You know, I'm not saying that it's not, but we should be looking at the the S and the G part as well. You we should be looking at the social and the governance part, right? So when we talk about sustainability, it encompasses all. So it also includes about the survivability of the company, survivability of the industry. So no point for you to have a business which is not profitable because it's not sustainable. You cannot provide jobs to people. You cannot put food on the table. So that, that's where the angle of sustainability comes from. I, I, I just want to make it, you know, you know, put it up there. That it goes beyond, uh, you know, low carbon. Uh, it goes beyond sort of uh, green stuff. It, it includes as well as social and governance. How business is being governed. How transparent our business, and you know. So, um, and and we we see that uh, as not an option anymore in the new world, if you like, if, because the whole world is moving towards that. And even as you mentioned, the the, the vision, the prime minister wants to get uh, sort of an alignment, a more better alignment. A better alignment with the SDG 17 uh, by 2030, and this uh, RMK 12 is actually uh, almost like a platform to get this closer to, to that particular vision, right? And and um, as we have been saying, um, sustainable business meaning um, profitable business, profitable business meaning that they have to the business has to be resilient. It has to be able to stand, uh, you know, tough times not just locally but overseas as well. So all these elements, if you like, it's, it, it is being encapsulated by the blueprint. 
right? So uh, hopefully when we, when we launch the initiatives, when some of the industry actually react to some of the initiatives that we introduced by the blueprint, then the whole industry can move forward. So the, the whole spirit of sustainability will be uh, captured and, and then you know one of the pillars will be addressed in, in uh, ultimately. So um, I shall not go into you know the use of gas as as um, a transition fuel. I think that's as a well known fact. Uh, we, we we support that it makes sense. It makes sense. It addresses the issue of uh, 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 you know in terms I can't even say the word intermittency issue. Yeah, and, you know even though I noticed that Siraj also had pointed out we need bigger batteries. That, that is a, a solution. There are I'm sure there are numerous solutions that you can actually look into this. Some of these technology challenges. But uh, this is, I think, where um, you know uh, OGSE companies, if they have that technology, it can be commercialized, can actually sustain the industry, and that is where essentially how the OGSE industry, together with the blueprint, can help propel the whole sector forward. Over back, back to you then, uh, Afik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um I see there's one question from uh, the audience here, which I think it's uh, it's quite interesting. Um, it's from uh, Shukri, and um, I think this question would be fitting for maybe Encik Azizul to comment or Encik Yazid also to support. Um, how, I'll, I'll read the question now, how NGA um, or, you know, oil and gas players will respond to the newly announced carbon pricing plan to be imposed by uh, the government of Malaysia? You need to call out somebody. Maybe I can just volunteer and uh, take you three to answer that first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, uh, maybe it's good to hear from the industry. How how would you respond? I mean, from service provider, because yeah. then the cost of doing business has actually gone up a bit by having an element of uh, carbon tax. Um. Yeah, I think just you know, just uh, randomly, just to answer that, I believe that will be some some challenge you know that will be a challenge for 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 medium sized uh, um you know players right for for you know big company like for example dialog in particular or or Delium, i i'm i'm sure that they already <laughs> put some plan you know long term for renewable energy and such but uh, you know um yeah i think to be fair there there should be some some element of uh, you know support from the, the from the governments you know i would say I, i'm not saying grant or something but I mean, the 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 bank or, or the, the 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 banker should think how to embed this in in the cost of doing business in Malaysia. So I think that that will be you know just from top of mind. Yeah, if I can add a uh, uh, pick. Uh, uh, okay, what what uh, for for carbon pricing and carbon tax? Uh, the uh, recently it has been mooted to be introduced as one of the uh, economic instrument. Um, of, of under the ASG, um, the I, I believe you know uh, I, I concur with with uh, uh, what call that uh, with the earlier suggestion that that government would then have to 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 be, to take an uh, um, active role to create perhaps a domestic platform first you know a domestic trading scheme before we you know uh, we try to tap up the market because it seems like you know. This uh, they they would be they, they they need to be established. They need to establish uh, uh key participants and key stakeholders in that trading scheme. So that's why I think in September uh, I mean in 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 early September there was announcement that the government is looking at domestic carbon emission trading scheme to be developed locally. Um, once we have got the mechanism all in place, I suppose then we have a bit more clarity on how this carbon tax and carbon pricing will work. Um, and how it would then translate to the cost of doing business for oil and gas players in Malaysia. Without that clarity, you know, it's, it's very difficult for the banks to gauge the impact of, of, of those things on the cost of the of, of doing business. Yeah. If, if I may add on, uh, Fik. Please. Um, <coughs> this is from my personal perspective anyway. We've been talking about the carbon tax and uh, carbon pricing as a, as a means to equalize the uh, the costs of um, the, the environmental costs of doing business if i may say that yeah it, it, it's meant to equalize um the cost penalize say for example the coal users uh, with a price of carbon so that they can actually neutralize their impact environmentally 
So um, for, for us to do that um, effectively uh, for Malaysia, I, I, I agree with uh, what Mr. Azizul has mentioned earlier, for us to start that's the, you know, the domestic sort of uh, emission trading scheme to look at the impact confined within Malaysia. But at the end of the day, um, it, the, the boundary is actually, you know, the whole, uh, this is almost like rather than the whole of the nation approach, it should, it should be the whole of the world approach. Because, um, you know, as far as the emissions are concerned, they don't confine themselves against ge any geographical boundary, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if we do have a different scheme, so then tends to be uh, opportunistic sort of uh, instances where there are arbitrage arbitrages that you can actually take advantage on. Then there'll be sort of uh, uh, the, the, the whole intention then doesn't doesn't meet um, you know, the, the whole thing, doesn't meet the whole, the original intention, if, if you like. The intention is actually to equalize, but people actually uh, turn this into an economic opportunity. They start um, to to uh, uh, you know to, to to go on price arbitrages across different carbon pricing across different uh, regions. So um, to to me that's 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 not right, uh, and and uh, you know that help that will have some impact on uh, Malaysia if you were to jump straight into the uh, that that kind of environment, because at the end of the day. What's important as well uh, in the spirit of WKB, you know, Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama 2030 is to make sure that no one is actually left behind and the cost of the rakyat is taken uh, into account. Because uh, the, to me, like, the easiest response when you start introducing carbon pricing, carbon tax, then where are you going to recover the cost from? You know, then you transfer to the consumers, to the end users, and that is not necessary in the spirit of WKB 2030. So um, there's a lot of work in short, there's a lot of work needs to be done. We have to uh, track this path carefully, but in general, that is the right direction uh, where we should be heading, because the whole world is actually heading that as well. We cannot be excluded from that. Thank you. Thank you, Encik Azir. Thank you, Encik uh, Azizul, Encik Yusri. Um, well, I, I hear you uh, mention about the environmental cost to the economy. Um, putting into a simpler context, Encik uh, Azir, what you mentioned, probably perhaps we can say that not everyone can afford an uh, electric vehicle um, in Malaysia, especially, right? Um, right, we, we uh, go to the next, I wish to go to the next question, uh, alluding to what we have discussed. When we talk about ESGs, uh, it means more and more oil and gas companies that are looking at energy diversific uh, diversification globally. So I would like to go to uh, Encik Rao here. Uh, taking into account on the various diversification of strategy um, many companies took, how is the OGSE sector adapting to the current changes towards cleaner energy? Mr. Rao. Right. Um, okay. And you, you, you saw that the big boys, the likes of BP, Shell, even Petronas for the matter, looking at um, you know diversification. Yeah, solar and, and, and rest of it. We applaud that. I think it's a good move, a great because it's gonna help the environment. But the hard truth is that, again, you know, going back to the point here is that none of this will give you the ROI that will make it profitable, sustainable on their own without subsidies. In a subsidized environment, like what you see in North America and Europe, in economies where you know a lot of subsidy that comes into it, it makes sense. But in economies, sorry, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Very okay. clear. Yep. In, in economies where um, subsidy is hard to come by when we have other social problems, the more pressing problems about development uh, uh, and the rest of it, it will be a tall order. To be very honest with you, to be a very tall order to go into, even if you look at solar, right? Solar many years ago when the tariff was, was good, one dollar something, it was a good business. Today, the tariff has come down to below 20 cents per kilowatt. So you cannot make it profitable at, without subsidy. That's a hard truth, you know? And we don't have wind in this part of the world. Forget about it. Even like I said, mentioned earlier, you know, with, during the summer, uh, there's already these issues about not having enough wind for, you know, to generate uh, 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 enough energy. 
So that's going to be a big issue, to be very honest with you. So there has to be certain amount of either some form of uh, either you pay a premium for the energy transition or a subsidy. Well, that's the only way for a lot of company, companies to embark on unless you've got a deep pocket. Yeah, you've got a deep pocket, you've got a social agenda, the likes of what Petronas is doing and the likes of what BP Shell is doing. Yes. The one thing that we can focus on, yeah, we can focus on is how to make, how to work efficiently, how to reduce emission. You know, little, little things, even the, I've given my team a, a target on how can we put catalytic converter in, on, on, a, on a generators when you're working, you know? Uh, we all have an obligation to make the world cleaner. There's no doubt about it. How we do it, go, how do we go about and do it? There are many different ways of doing it. It doesn't have to be investing in renewable energy alone. That's one of it. It's good. It's great if we can, but there are also other ways of contributing to the planet for global warming and so on, which is looking into energy efficiency, reducing emission. Those are the things that, that can be looked at, and I think that's the focus for the service companies, the way I look at it, where we can step up and do something about it. I, guess, I don't know if I've answered the question. Uh, okay. Well, um... To me, Mr. Rao, it, it's very clear, um, and I'm very sure it is also to all of the audience here today. Uh, we've been talking a lot about ESG sustainability, and um, I hear and I see Encik Yazid nodding, and uh, we had a conversation before, and we mentioned that sometimes sustainability is taking a lot of spotlight over uh, you know, the reality of things, like you said, somebody needs, still need to put uh, an affordable food on the table, right? Uh, profitability is uh, an important factor as well. Um, but... Uh, Another thing that I wanted to highlight, Chiafik, is that uh, um, when it comes to the renewable energy and getting going to uh, zero uh, emission and so on, uh, I think a lot of countries are over-promising and going to under-deliver. Let's take note of that. Maybe it may, you may not see it today. Uh, a lot of economies, a lot of organizations are willing, unwilling to speak the truth when it comes to all this, especially on renewable. They're all jumping on board because there's so much of pressure. If you listen to CNN, BBC, there's so much of pressure about, on, on, on global warming. Fire here, fire there. It's all caused by fossil fuel. And uh, there's so much of pressure on all these economies. Economies or countries and organizations are succumbing to the pressure and saying, you know what, we're going to be zero by 2030, 2050, 2040. It's going to be an overpromise under deliver. That's my view. It's a personal view. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rao. I like the conversation. Well, um, I'm aware of the time. We have about seven minutes to go. Um, I would like to go to this one last question that uh, let's do a round robin here, starting with um, uh, Yusri first. I have one question for everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and the question is, what are the essential factors that ensures a sustainable gas industry in Malaysia? Essential factors. Um, make it short. Um, I believe, uh, you know, I have to look at Mr. Yazid here. Basically, the government for me have to play a very critical role in this. Um, you know, um, there is a need, uh, you know, to come up with the the best investment environment solution or formula, you know, and how how to pull in uh, to pull in the FDI in the countries, you know. So without, I'm not saying without continuous FDI, but you know, with with interrupt FDI flow coming in into the country, it will I think it will eventually hinder the progress, you know. And I can see the bankrupt, you know, the pembangunan is like um, that hinder the progress and eventually will impact the, the overall sustainability plan um, for the gas industry in Malaysia. So, so I, th I think that is my my thought on this, uh, Afiq. Thank you, Encik Yusri. Um, Encik Azizu, can I go uh, next to you then? Yeah, um, okay. I think the, the, the key success factor for oil and gas uh, going forward uh, Hinges on how I mean their their stand and and perhaps their commitment to 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 clean energy. 
um, and and how well or how 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 sincere they are uh, in adopting ESG investing. I mean, like it or not, the wave will be will be coming and reaching. In fact, has reached reached our shores. Uh, we see that basically the 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 financial regulators has been very aggressive putting in a lot of ESG measures uh, to be applied to all the PLCs and oil and gas companies. So it's just a matter of adopting those those measures. So, so we if if you know the the longer it takes for them to 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 adopt policy ESG in policies and practices, you know the the, the harder or the or the more cumbersome for oil and gas company to to survive in future. That's that's my key, that's my key take. Go ahead. Thank you, Encik Azizo. Uh, that's very insightful to survive. That's very very important. Um, Mr. Rao, if I can go next to you, Mr. Rao. No, uh, okay. Uh, maybe I'd like to address uh, one of the questions out there by Siraj. You know, uh, I agree with him. I agree with him. The solar energy cost is lower than gas in US. That is true. That's not. It's true. But you have to understand the amount of subsidy that has gone into uh, green energy during Obama's time. You know, trillions of dollars have been subsidized. I mean, Tesla, for example. Tesla is the biggest beneficiary of subsidy. Billions and billions of dollars. Of course, if I get the subsidy, I can produce everything at a cheaper price. That is true, you know? So we can argue about it, but, you know, it, it is true, you know, it is cheaper, but it's because of the subsidy. If Malaysia, Malaysian government were to put in, say, $100 billion subsidy in solar, solar energy cost can be cheaper. Of course it'll be, yeah? So again, we can discuss that later. But but I think from the from our perspective, um, I think we have to be from the oil and gas side of it. We have to be a little bit more responsible industry. We cannot continue to go and pollute the world or environment. Um, the likes of the incidents that happened in Gulf of Mexico. I can't remember what the, what was the incident. Um, and somebody helped me. You know those kind of things cannot. So we have to be a little bit more responsible as an industry. We that's the only way to survive, and we got to look at uh, how we can reduce emission. You know, yes, we need at places where we can take diesel away and use uh, solar panels. We have to do look into that. So we have to get back in. I mean, we got to get back into the good books of the of of the investors generally. And you saw what happened with Exxon, yeah. Uh, uh, a classic example, everyone is getting very environmentally conscious. So we all have to have a green agenda and we got to aspire to it and work towards it. Otherwise, we will not be accepted as an industry in the long run. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rao. Uh, last but not the least, Jay uh, Yeah, I don't have much time, I guess. Uh, well, well, I, I guess I, we can summarize that you know the factors, um, essential factors to ensure the sustainability of gas industry in Malaysia into four, maybe four and a half or five. Yeah, the first one we, we have to make sure that the market is efficient. The market, it, you know, it has a good liquidity in that sense. So to do that, we we need to look at uh, probably a change of a uh, business model. We need to attract players to uh, make sure that um, um, you know to more more players to compete from the supply side, for example. Yeah, and that's the spirit of the TPA anyway. We try introducing more than uh, one supplier. So like I said, you know, to make sure that the market becomes efficient, more liquid. That's the first part. Second part, then we can we need to start to attract um, domestic, uh, local as well as foreign investors to come in and to take part not only in the gas market, also for in, in the gas infrastructure. You know, if they can build more RGT, say for example, that provides that flexibility, if you like, you know, rather than uh, so not so only school, you know, uh, then, then the providers is flexibility. That's the first part. Second point. The third point is actually on the um, pricing. The price has to be trusted. It has to be transparent for people to get excited to come in and be part of the market within Malaysia. That will ensure, uh, you know, the sustainability of the gas industry. Sustainability as in like, you know, profitable and long sort of living as well. Yeah. And last but not least, to do this, it goes back, this is nicely sort of wrapped together. We need to have a robust, resilient, and globally competitive OGSE industry. So without these guys, without the likes of uh, JU3, without the likes of uh, Jin Rao, uh, you know, the, the OGSE guys, champions out there, that, um, you know, we, we, 
you, you could not get the right support to ensure the sustainability of the gas industry in Malaysia. So that's it. And the point five, because that's four, 4.5 you mentioned, maybe the point five is the collaboration within uh, the public and the private sectors. You know, the days of where the public sector knows everything is actually, it is long gone. So we need to get input from the players as well. So uh, thank you. Back to you, Danafik. Thank you so much, Yazid. Uh, that brings us to the end of our conversation, gentlemen, and I would like to um, share here three key takeaways, at least, that I have uh, noted. Number one, uh, the positive future of natural gas. We've been talking about that. Um, natural gas will be playing even more important role to support the low carbon economy. That's number one. Number two, hydrocarbon is here to stay, uh, mentioned many times by uh, NJ Rao. And uh, number three, from the financial sector, ESG uh, you know, has been much more important than ever. Nonetheless, uh, the economics, the sustainability of the gas industry is still also important, like NJ as I mentioned. It needs to be, uh, you know, the, the, the pricing needs to be uh, transparent and uh, the industry needs to live uh, longer than what we expect, right? And uh, with that, and on behalf of NGA, Malaysian Gas Association, I wish to thank all of you um, today, the speakers, uh, with our sincere thanks to the audience who are with us today. And I then pass uh, the session back to our MC, Afrina. Thank you.